Hey guys, so today we're going to keep reading Navigating Early. I'm just going to give you a big review because it's been a long, long, long time since we've read it. Um, so Early and Jack, the two main characters, just started off on their journey um, over fall break and they're going down a river and all of these things keep happening that are really similar to the pie story that Early's been telling. Um, so they're just on their quest and right where we left off we just learned something pretty big so um we learned that fisher is early's brother we knew that already um but we just learned that early believes that he really believes that fisher is still alive because he sees a lot of connections between the story about pie and the story of his brother um and so we just learned that um, early really believes that his brother's still alive. So that's where we're going to pick up. We're going to finish chapter 14 and then read chapter 15 today. So, heavy casualties, Jackie. That means those Germans killed a lot of them, but not Fisher. They missed him. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Early was shaping the pie story to match what he knew of his brother's life in the army. I wanted to smack him, but my heart was breaking for him at the same time. I tried reminding him of the facts, but the dog tags, the letter, they tried to tell me he was dead. They must not have known he said he'd come back. That's what he told me before he left. And now he's looking for the great bear, just like Pi. And when he finds him, he won't be lost anymore. The great bear, now it was clear. The great Appalachian bear. Early, you need to listen to me very carefully. Are you listening? Yes, Jackie, I'm listening. They all say they're coming back. Every soldier says that, and they mean it. They want to believe it. It's just that not all of them make it back. I know that some of the soldiers die, but Fisher is still alive, and he's coming back. See here? Early said, pulling more newspaper clippings and notes from his backpack. His squad was supposed to blow up in the Gaston Bridge along the Allier River in central France. With the direction of the current that night and the fact that there was a full moon, but I didn't care about protecting Early's theories or his feelings. I had had enough. He isn't coming back, I yelled. Yes, he is. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. Early, Fisher is dead. No, he isn't. Criminy, this could go on all night. Look, you've got his dog tags. You've got a letter from the army, just like every other family in that squad got dog tags and a letter. What makes you think you're so special that your brother should come home when the rest of them aren't? Because Pi isn't dead, and if Pi isn't dead, then neither is Fisher. Early hugged his knees and began rocking back and forth. Oh, I breathed. That was, that was why Early was so intent on proving that the Pi of his number story was still alive. That's why it upset him so much to have Professor Stanton suggest that the number Pi would end. Early had said he wasn't making up the story of Pi. He was just reading it. But I didn't believe him. I thought Early was making up a story. Until now. It was partly in the way that Early told the story, in words that didn't seem to be his own. But mostly, it was in his inability to control the story. If Early needed Pi to be alive in order for Fisher to be alive, why didn't he just create the story that way? Because he couldn't. The story was not his to create. He was only retelling it, translating the story he had read in the numbers. Early needed the numbers to continue, the story to continue, and he needed Pi to stay alive. Because in his strange, convoluted, and amazing mind, if Pi was dead, that meant Fisher was dead also. I knew it made no sense, I knew it was crazy, but how could I argue with him? Part of me wished I had some crazy story that would make me think my mom was still alive, and that she would eventually come back but my brain didn't work that way. I lay back, my heart pounding. As I stared up at the stars, it became clear to me that in joining early in this quest, I'd certainly gotten into more than I had bargained for, but I knew I wasn't ready to turn back. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't continuing out of any sense of fidelity, duty, honor, or any of those other words that early liked to throw around. It was just curiosity and maybe a little fear of getting lost on my own. I had no need to stick it out or complete the quest. No, Early was the one who couldn't leave a frog behind. I would have cut Bucky loose in a heartbeat. And in this case, that would have been a better idea because by the next morning, Bucky was dead. 
Okay, remember who's Bucky? It's Early's frog. So we just found out that Early's frog died. Okay, chapter 15. In the gray of early dawn, I kicked some dirt over the fire, which had long since died out, and we packed up our stuff without a word. The without a word part was fine, as I was sure that enough had been said the night before. Besides, early was in mourning. He laid Bucky on a sturdy maple leaf and set him adrift in the river. The current carried him out of sight, so at least the poor kid didn't have to see his frog get swallowed up by a 15-pound trout. A big old I told you so was on the tip of my tongue. My mom used to say, don't pour salt on the wound or you'll never get the taste out of your mouth. So I kept my mouth shut. I was ready to get going, but Early said we needed a song for the funeral. I let out a sigh and waited for him to start up with Amazing Grace or maybe Rock of Ages. But once he started singing a heartfelt and very off-key rendition of Up a Lazy River, I realized it was Monday. That meant Louis Armstrong. It did provide a nice send-off for old Bucky, and with that we lowered the mane onto the water and took up our positions. My arms and legs, cold and stiff from sleeping on the hard ground, practically moaned as I took the first few strokes through the morning fog. We hadn't brought along any of the wax, honey, and vinegar concoction, but Early was apparently taking a moment to primp a bit as he put on some kind of ointment or lotion that he had in a flat, round canister. His meticulous attention to covering every area of exposed skin grated on my nerves. First the nose and ears, then neck, cheeks, hands, and ankles. When he reapplied it to the ears, I had had enough. What is that stuff? I grumbled. It smells like shoe polish. It's made out of mentholatum, lemon juice, and saddle soap. It keeps the bugs away. Bugs? What bugs? As soon as I asked it, I had a feeling I knew what was coming. Remember that part where Pi runs into a swarm of biting insects? They can't be too far off, and I don't like to get bitten by bugs. I did remember that part. In fact, I must have listened more closely to the story of Pi than I thought. The bugs, the sharks, the hurricane, I remembered it all. I smiled at Early, the kind of smile you give to a little kid who still believes in the tooth fairy. Well, you be sure to lather up real good then. Sit tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. If I'd been sitting any closer, I might have ruffled his hair. I rode on as the fog thickened around us and then, ouch, I slapped the back of my neck. Then again at my hand and ankle. It wasn't fog. It was a cloud of mosquitoes or biting gnats or maybe flies. Early sat calmly, apparently unaffected by the bugs. Ouch, I said again, swatting at my cheek. Kind of late in the season for mosquitoes, isn't it? It's been a warmer than usual fall, Early said, looking over the side of the boat. It's called an Indian summer. That's the opposite of a blackberry winter. Quick, give me that stuff. I'm being eaten alive. Early tossed me the tin as he concentrated, staring intently into the water, first on the starboard side of the boat, then the port. Shh, he whispered with a finger to his lips. What, do you think my talking's going to attract more bugs? I think we're already in the thick of it. Not bugs, he whispered, still gazing into the water. Sharks. I stared at him. I even opened my mouth to explain to him that sharks did not live in freshwater rivers. But after swatting another insect, I clamped my mouth shut, grabbed the dragging oars, and began rowing with a vengeance. The Kennebec River stretched out for miles in front of us. Once I'd gotten an early bug repellent on, the insects left me alone and we eventually rode out of the swarm. By nine o'clock, the clouds had lifted and the air around us was crisp and clear. I always loved October at home. With its morning chill in the air, the afternoon sun warming the wooden planks of the front porch, bowls of steaming chili, and of course, baseball. I could feel a familiar ache coming back again and I didn't want it. I needed something to distract me. So early, why don't you fill me in on the latest installment of Pi? What's been going on in his world lately? There's only a few numbers left that I know, and I don't have those memorized. Some parts I can tell from memory, and other parts I need to read the numbers. After that, I have to figure out more numbers, but it takes a lot of calculating. That made me wonder, how did Early read those numbers? It was clear to me now that he was not making up a story and pretending that it came from the numbers. I should have known Early was not one to play make-believe. He may have thought some crazy, unbelievable things, but he believed them. Can you teach me to read numbers? I asked. 
I don't think it's something you can learn. Nobody taught me. I've just always seen the numbers differently than most people. Fisher says it's a gift. He says when he sees the numbers that start with 3.14, it's just a bunch of figures that don't mean anything more than numbers. That made me sad for him. For me, they're blue and purple and sand and ocean and rough and smooth and loud and whispering all at the same time. He paused for a breath. I wished I could see what he saw, color and landscape, texture and voice. We passed under a rain cloud that shed a few sprinkles on us. It made me think of Billie Holiday, her rich voice. She could just hum with no words and you could hear the sadness, the pain, the feeling. That made me think. Maybe it's like listening to music, I said. How it can make you feel things without any words. There was a song at my mother's funeral. It was all in Latin and I didn't understand a word of it. But the way the sounds blended together and the music rose and fell, well, it could make a person cry if they were prone to that sort of thing. I blinked hard. How come Kansas doesn't have any color? We have color. No, you don't. Yes, we... Oh, no. Not that again. What makes you think we don't have color? Because in The Wizard of Oz, Kansas is all in black and white and grays. There's no color until Dorothy gets to Oz. Oh, I laugh. That's only in the movies. Kansas has plenty of color, especially in the fall. I allowed the memory of it to draw me back. The sky is a beautiful blue. Like the ocean? Kind of. My mom said if the world ever got turned upside down, you could just dive right into the sky and swim in it. And the wheat just before harvest is a golden blanket of waves and ripples. That's nice. What does it sound like? It's just waving wheat. It doesn't make any noise. But then I thought about it. Well, I guess if you really listen hard, it makes a shushing sound. What if you listened harder? If I listened harder, I closed my eyes as I kept rowing. I suppose it would sound kind of happy and full, like Benny Goodman and his plan playing in the mood. It would be music you'd want to dance to. I kept my eyes closed, trusting early to guide me if I started rowing off course. And then there's all the fall produce in my mom's garden and the Bentley orchards. I could practically feel the dirt under my hands. The pumpkins are bright orange. There are sweet red apples and yellow squash. And of course there's plenty of green. And all that ends up sounding like, mmm, pumpkin pie, meaty stews, and cinnamon apple cobbler. And the trees, yeah, the trees, said Early. I opened my eyes. I'd always liked the brilliance of leaves changing color at home, but here, I'd never been surrounded by trees like this, their leaves all turning color to bright oranges, deep yellows, and flaming reds. Whole forests of trees that looked like they were on fire. I eased up on the rowing, grateful for the rest and the moment to soak it all up. Early had given me a glimpse into what he saw and heard and felt through his numbers, and there was beauty in it and it was warm and real. I suppose if color could be sound, I said, these trees would be playing a whole symphony. A Mozart symphony, Early answered, if it were Sunday. We rode along in a contented quiet, listening to the sounds of all the colors around us, when a barge emerged from a little side stream and pulled up alongside our boat. There were seven or eight bearded and weathered faces staring down at us. These faces belonged to a ragged band that leaned over their ship's railing with arms crossed. They smelled a little rank, even from a distance, and looked like they'd been apart from civilization for some time. They just stared, and I wondered if they were waiting for us to speak first. Then the group parted, and a large man stepped forward. He placed his hands on the rail of the barge and peered down at us. Dense trees reached out over the Kennebec River, allowing brief flashes of light to shine through the branches and leaves as we floated underneath. It was in those flashes that I could see the man's face. It was scarred on one side and a black patch covered his left eye. That's a fine looking boat you have there, lads. His face pulled into a contorted smile. You look like you've had a long stretch of rowing. How about we tether your boat behind ours and we'll motor you upstream a ways? Early caught his breath. His eyes opened wide. I stopped rowing and our boat lagged just a bit behind their barge. It was enough distance for Early to whisper what was on his mind. Pirates. 
Okay, so we'll stop there for today. We'll pick up with chapter 16 next time.